Have you ever had someone tell your story before? I mean, have you ever had someone tell your story on your behalf? Something deep, something painful, something that mattered, something where if the story was told out of order or without all the details, it evokes a strong emotion because it's not right. You feel frustrated. Maybe it came up in conversation with colleagues or friends, how your relationship broke down, how you didn't get your job promotion. Have you ever had someone tell your story and distort it? Or maybe have you ever told someone your story before in the hopes that they would hear it and listen and respond, only to have them keep going about their life as if they'd never heard it? Well, today we're facing a serious problem in the likes of this when we think about the Syrian refugee crisis. And before I start, let me note that this does not discount the plight of refugees in Uganda or Myanmar or North Korea. I'm talking about Syria for two reasons. First, this is the largest crisis of human displacement since the Second World War. And second, it intersects with my story. So now I'm faced with this great challenge because in order to tell you my story today, I have to enter in at least a little bit to the stories of the people that I've met. And even though they've all told me to come here and tell you their stories, what if I get it wrong? Like, what if they'd rather that I told you about something that I've never even heard about yet in their lives? Or what if, instead of standing here for 15 minutes, I should go up to each one of you after and tell you the full story? What if? Yesterday, I received a text message from the woman in this photo. She's an English teacher from Syria. That's her husband and two sons. And she said, I want you to show them this photo. This is my husband. And I said, what is he doing? And she said, he's waving a red card at the ocean. And I still didn't understand. And she said, he's a professional referee. And then I understood what was going on. Show them this photo. Tell them my story. I first heard about the Syrian refugee crisis three years ago. In Vancouver, I was on Facebook scrolling through my feed when I saw this photo, a Syrian woman weeping. And she was wearing the same bench jacket that I wear all the time except for mine is black and hers is gray. And she told her story, it went something like this. She was about to get into a plastic inflatable dinghy boat to go to safety and she got scared, but the smugglers kept the money. Don't worry. And she got in the boat, but it was too crowded and the captain said, don't worry. And then the water started coming in the bottom of the boat and she was one of the last people out and she's in the water with her husband. Don't worry. And then he gives his life jacket to someone else so another woman can survive. Don't worry. See, I feel like we talk about this in our culture all the time. Don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. And there's truth to that. Like there's really some things we can't control, but there's also things that we can do. So... Sitting there, I felt incredibly disturbed. Like, what am I supposed to do? Sit here and go on about my night and send one or five or 10 more text messages to my friends or write one or five or 10 more academic essays about who knows what? Well, that is going on. And so I made a Facebook post because what else is there to do? Hashtag help refugees. Hashtag share this post. Hashtag does this do anything, maybe? And 50 people shared it, and one girl commented, and she said, have you heard about this lecture at UBC by Dan Heber? It's about Syria, do you want to come? And I said, yeah, let's go. Single sentence, single sentence. And so we went, and the room was buzzing with academics and professionals and students who all wanted to do something, and this is some of what we learned. In addition to this, there are 2 million Syrian refugees in Turkey right now. 55% of whom are children, only 10% of those children are in school, and 70,000 babies have been born in Turkey. Babies. So back to the story. Another student came up and she talked about private sponsorship. I'm passionate about private sponsorship, she said. This is how it works, she said, single sentence, single sentence. And so I researched it, and Canada is the only country in the world with a citizen-directed private sponsorship of refugees program, which means that in a group of five or with a church or a mosque, you can sponsor refugees. And the paperwork looks like this. 
This is the paperwork to sponsor eight refugees to Canada, and I can tell you that it's rigorous. It does not happen overnight. And going through this process, I thought to myself, how would I do this if this was me? I don't even know where I would access this documentation, go through my filing cabinet, find references. But then what about the violence? And what if I didn't have those documents anymore? Then what, then what happens? So we got together and I said, I want to start a movement. And she said, yes, I do. I want to do that too. Single sentence, single sentence. So we met together and we started up with a single Facebook post, not knowing what would happen. And that's where AMS Refugee Relief at UBC was born. In the first year, we partnered with a local church and a dedicated Vancouver family to raise $72,000 collectively for a family of refugees. And I remember sitting at Granville Island with one of the newcomers. He was my very same age. And we sat there looking out to the horizon at night. And I asked him, what do you like about Vancouver? And he said, it's quiet. And I wondered what he must be thinking about back at home. So this summer, I went to Turkey. Because what happened, after the first family came, we need to keep going, and we got an email, a single email. It was quite serendipitous timing. And this Canadian girl who'd been in Turkey before me told me, I know four refugees, and I've met them, and they need help. Two were newlyweds. They met in elementary school. <laughs> Don't we all love that? And he's a biochemist, and she makes handicrafts, like the bracelets that I'm wearing. It's from her. And they're volunteering at NGOs in Turkey, and I'd never even heard of such a thing before. Like, when you think of NGO, you think privileged people going to help, but have you thought of refugees helping refugees for five years in Turkey? I hadn't. And so I went there and met them, and we toured around Istanbul for a day. I was already in the area, and we had so much fun, and we were laughing. And as Mustafa, who you see in the photo, shared his testimony of atrocity after atrocity, he was still laughing and still finding joy. And I thought, is this allowed? Like, somehow humor and atrocity are incompatible. So then, I went to Greece. Because I'd heard about it from some girls in Abbotsford. They told me they went there before. And they said there's scabies in the camp and the Coast Guard shoots boats when they try and come across the sea. And I knew I needed to go, but I had this perception in my head, like, oh, I'm gonna get off the plane, and it's gonna be dark and dreary and dangerous. And that's what I saw. It's beautiful, isn't it? It's kind of like home. Okay, I can do this. Single plane ticket, Greece. So I arrived in Greece at this refugee camp, and my job was to take care of the first arrivals. So on the first day, 66 refugees came and lined up. And it was a strange juxtaposition between hope and hopelessness. Some children were smiling, some were crying, a woman fainted. And I felt this weird sort of existential who knows what, like I just want to meet everyone and build relationships, but what is happening in the background? And how did all these single sentences lead me here, like the single Humans of New York Facebook post, and then the single sentence leading to the private sponsorship conversation, and everyone coming together at UBC, and now this is happening. What is even happening? And I remember one night, three men came up, and they shook the fence and said, Sister, sister, we need toilet paper. And I looked behind me, and there were five rolls of toilet paper. And I gave them each three or four pieces. And they said, sister, sister, we need more. We can't come back every time. And I felt like a criminal because there's more refugees coming every day. But when is more toilet paper going to come? This is a photo of me and my cousin here in Abbotsford when we were four and five. And we used to dress up after our bubble baths and towel dresses and come out and smile in my kitchen. <laughs> there we are. And there's a moment that I'll never forget of a little girl named Lean. She's four years old. And she came out in all her glory in her towel dress after having had a shower and her and her mama were there and they were smiling but behind her was a barbed wire cage and garbage cans heaping with trash and her bathroom looked something like this. At least that's what Google says. I never went in, probably should have, but I heard about it. Everyone told me and I know it's true because the water bottles that you see on the floor are the exact same ones that I gave out every day to the new arrivals. So I felt frustrated, like what am I supposed to do? How can I go back to school with this going on? Who's gonna translate French to English? Who's going to play with the kids boat after boat after boat? And I confided into my friend. She came from Cameroon. 
She was pregnant with twins and single, and I told her I don't know what to do. And she said, go back to school. Single sentence, important sentence. But I didn't want to, so I came back the next day. I don't know if I should go back because really, and she slapped me. (laughs) Like, come on, don't you see? There's 2,600 people here that need you to fight and 10 million more where they came from, like we learned about before. This is the life jacket graveyard in Malivos, Greece. And you can imagine what it represents. When we were there, a dump truck came with more, and they come three or four times a day. And standing there, it's almost overwhelming because how can you feel such emotion? Like I can hardly feel emotion for myself or the person beside me and you see this. And then right on the other side of the mountain is a beautiful beach town with bellinis and martinis and even in such geographic proximity to what's going on, what do you even do? But this is what I want to share about today. The single sentence. Because I've really come to believe that everything that happens in the world is some sort of result of the cognitive unseen from our hearts and our minds that comes out in a single sentence. Like if Bashar al-Assad were to stand up today and announce, the war is over, there will be peace, then the violent turmoil would start to fizzle out. Single sentence, but he didn't say that. So what are we going to do with our single sentences? I received an email two weeks ago from Killarney Secondary School in Vancouver, single email, it said, Hi, I heard about your group. We want to start one at our school and send all the profits to refugees. Can we do this? And I said, yes, of course. How did you hear of us? They said, Google search, single sentence. And I feel like it's the fear of what might happen if the single sentence or idea doesn't work out that stops us some of the times. It's the maybe space. But then the next week, I got another email from Frank Hurt Secondary in school, or in Surrey wanting to do the exact same thing. Single sentence, single email, single choice. So I want to close with this. This is a photo of graffiti in the refugee camp written by someone who I don't know, who's not here to tell you their story. Take care of the people. Single sentence. Have you ever had someone tell your story? Thank you.